and what is old. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Beloved, grace and peace are yours from the God who seeks after us until we are found. Amen. The gospel readings that have been assigned for the past several weeks have kept us in one chapter of Matthew, in Matthew 13. And they have located us within one day. We have been all these weeks in one day in the life of Jesus and the disciples and the crowds. The chapter begins with Jesus leaving the house where he'd been teaching the disciples and the crowds. And he has been, he, before that he'd been healing and arguing with religious leaders and he was even too busy to see his mother and brothers. But at the dawn of chapter 13, he leaves the house and he sits beside the sea and he begins to teach in parables. And so in the verses we read today, we reach the part of the story where Jesus is winding down this particular set of teachings. He has actually gone back into the house for most of this reading, and we miss that detail because of the way that the lectionary is shaped. But it's important because it's Jesus and his disciples. They've gone back into the house. Think about the disciples. Remember last week they asked him to explain the parables to them? I wonder if after all of this teaching and all of the people who needed to be healed and all of their demands and the Pharisees arguing with him, I wonder if Jesus was weary at this point. Was he tired? Was his spirit as tired as his body? Was he tired of the disciples' endless questions? And so today's gospel reading, Jesus puts forth a series of examples of what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's sort of like a lightning round of parables. Jesus begins with another seed sowing example. This time it's a mustard seed. And if you do your research, you will learn that mustard seeds are not actually the smallest of all the seeds. And they do not actually grow up into big enough shrubs that birds can make their nests there. Mustard seeds were a nuisance plant. They were the blackberry vines (laughs) of the time. They were hard to get rid of. Then Jesus goes on to talk about the kingdom of heaven being like yeast that a woman takes and mixes in with three measures of flowers. Any bakers? Yes, all right. So um, that sounds reasonable, right? Yeast, three measures of flowers, except three measures of flowers equals 144 cups of flour. (laughs) So it's been noted that one would need a 100 quart mixer with a dough hook as big as your leg to accommodate all of that flour and all of that yeast. Then Jesus goes on to say that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that you found in someone else's field and the finder goes and sells everything they have so they could buy the field where the treasure is. The scholar Amy Jill Levine has noted that legally in those days, one would not have had to purchase the field to have kept the treasure. If you found a treasure in a field, it was yours to keep. Then, Jesus sticks with that analogy of the kingdom as being something that we find, and he talks about the pearl of great price, of such value that the merchant who deals in pearls goes and sells everything they have to purchase this one pearl. And if you think about this for a minute, it means that the merchant has nothing else. No clothes, no home, no belongings, no possessions, no inventory with which to do business because they have sold everything to possess this one pearl. And finally, Jesus ends with a fishing example. He says the kingdom is like a net thrown into the sea, yields all the fish, good and bad fish, and that the bad fish are thrown out. 
But here's what Jesus and his disciples would know. Even the bad fish that you can't eat had some purpose. They might have been used for bait or parts of them might have been used for other things. Rarely in this economy would something be thrown out. So Jesus has offered the disciples five really confusing examples of what the kingdom of heaven is like. And then he turns to them and says, have you understood all this? And the disciples say, uh-huh. <laughs> really? I mean, the disciples never understood what Jesus was talking about, which is why I can relate to them so well. And here he's given them this string of parables that don't make much sense, and now they say they understand. But don't we do this too? Don't we answer a question just to avoid the conversation? How was school today? Fine. What would you like for dinner? Anything. Anything is never the answer. How are you doing? Good. Do you understand these things? Yes. So if the disciples are not going to ask Jesus more about these unusual examples, I think it's our job this morning to wrestle with them. What does Jesus mean when he uses examples that don't seem to make much sense, that are confusing, that are confounding? And as we wonder about this, it's worth noting that parables are not riddles that Jesus offered to be solved, and they are not fables that contain a clear moralistic ending. Parables are stories that contain a deeper meaning, that there is a hidden truth for us to search for that invites us to look again. They invite us to wrestle together. So in Matthew 13, Jesus is describing the reign of God or the kingdom of heaven, and for very good reasons, Jesus knows that he can't say, the kingdom of heaven is this. Instead, it's necessary to say the kingdom of heaven is like this. It's like a seed and some yeasty bread and fish and pearls and hidden treasure. And the more examples that he uses, the more likely it is that he's going to capture the imagination of those disciples and of us. If we're a baker, we'll be drawn to that image. If we're fisher folk, we'll be drawn to the fish or gardeners to the mustard seed. And we'll take our own experiences and our cultural location and what is happening with us in our own hearts and we'll weave them with Jesus stories to understand something of what the kingdom of heaven is like. So here's an example from this place. I didn't know Sonia Miller but I, and I don't know the details of this story, but the presence of Little Lamb's preschool would make me say that the kingdom of heaven is like a person who loves the littles. And so she dreams of a place where they can grow and learn and play and be safe. And even though there's nothing there, she dreams and works with her congregation to create a place that is now filled with the laughter of children. And to go with the gardening metaphor from Jesus and from the story time this morning, I'm not a very good gardener, by the way, um, but one time I grew some zucchini, <laughs> which apparently is not that hard. <laughs> uh, well, at least in the Midwest, it wasn't that hard, but I thought that the bigger they got, the better they were. <laughs> so the kingdom of heaven, is like zucchini, picked at exactly the right time before they get too big and, and too tough because the kingdom of God, like the zucchini, at the right time can make all the difference. 
Or, the kingdom of heaven is like an organ stop called a zimbelstern. Do you all know what a zimbelstern is? When Sherry, I learned this from Bruce Shaw last week. Um, so when Sherry plays this, there's a beautiful stop that sounds exactly like angel's wings. And it's so special that you don't play it all the time. But when you play it, you know it's, there's something big and important happening. But the sound of the bells in a zimbelstern, which I got to see one last week at the Fritz Organ Shop, is, is made more uh, beautiful and richer and deeper because it has these very nondescript iron bars hanging in the midst of them. And Bruce Shaw said to me, it's these bars hitting the bells that create chaos that make the sound more beautiful. The kingdom of heaven is like a zimbelstern, or the kingdom of heaven is like chaos. Perhaps what Jesus is doing with the disciples and with us is reminding us that signs of the kingdom of God are all around us, everywhere. And our task is to look at the treasures that are before us, old and new, and to see what they have to teach us about God's kingdom. Even the details that do not seem to make sense matter because there are things in this world and in our lives that make absolutely no sense, that confound us, that break our hearts, that make us angry. You know what that is for you and I know what it is for me, but in our life together, I can name a few things in this world that are confounding and make me angry, like how we're allowing the earth to literally burn too hot, like how school classrooms and movie theaters and concerts and parades have become shooting galleries. And we know, we know there is a way to lessen these things. But life is and always has been full of hard and heartbreaking things. And so Jesus uses examples that contain such complexities to remind us and the disciples in the midst of our heartbreak, in the midst of our trials, that God has not left us. That God weeps with us and for us. The kingdom of heaven is like a parent who weeps for the children they love who have wandered off into a thorny landscape, sure, sure to stab and scar them. The recognition of this truth is really when the Romans reading is needed. This beautiful reminder that neither death nor life nor trials in the present nor any trial to come will separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. That when life or the world seem unbearably sad or confusing or complicated and we don't know what to do and we don't know how to pray, the Spirit knows. The Spirit wraps herself around us and prays for us, interceding on our behalf with sighs that are too deep for words. And that somehow in ways we do not understand yet, God is working in us and through us and with us and alongside us so that goodness will reign in the kingdom. Dear people of God at Agnus Day, God is bringing treasures old and new into our lives and into this place. And our task is to see them and to share them even when they don't seem to be anything more than a shrub or a loaf of bread. God uses these ordinary daily gifts to point us to the vast riches of God's kingdom. Thanks be to God, and let the church say, Amen. Amen.